Here's a question for you. Did Mary have Jesus, the virgin birth, and then begin a relationship with Joseph? There are places in scriptures where it actually implies this. And that Jesus had other siblings, brothers. In this particular episode, we will address these and show without doubt that Mary is, was, and ever will be a virgin. Hence the dogma, the perpetual virginity of Mary, coming up in this episode. Welcome to Regina de Cor Carmeli Dot Faith, Educating for Eternity. If you've been following our series on Mary, the mother of Jesus, we have covered significant ground. We are currently in the middle of her dogmas, that is about Mary, what we believe as Catholics to be true and worthy of belief and also imposed on all Catholics to believe. If you are tuning in for the first time, we will highly encourage you to go and listen to some of our episodes and help and subscribe to this channel. I will actually put the links up the top there and also in the description page for you to go and subscribe and to listen to some of the early episodes that we have about Mary for it to make sense because it's really a series and we encourage you to do that. So in this episode, we will cover the third dogma on Mary, which is her perpetual virginity. That is, she is a virgin for now, was, and ever will be. Doesn't end with the birth of Jesus as some have, may have pointed out. And this particular perpetual virginity was declared at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. And it's also binding on all Catholics, which is what is a dogma that we have to believe it because it was revealed to us by God and founded in scripture. That's very important. The prophet Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. This is also, as I mentioned, quoted in St. Matthew's Gospel. But St. Matthew's Gospel speaks about the troubled Joseph. How can this be that Mary could be with child and we don't have any relation at all? But however, the angel eases his doubts. And he says to him, Joseph, do not fear, for what is with Mary is from the Holy Spirit. So he was informed as to what had happened. When Joseph woke up from the sleep, he did as the angel, the Lord, commanded him. He took Mary for his wife and he knew her not until she had born a son and he called his name Jesus. Boom, boom. There's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? Because it says he knew her not. In other words, he had no relation with her until she had her firstborn. Now, there's two clues there that for many people jump on this bandwagon, so to speak, and say that firstborn, after she had a baby, then he had relations with her. This is actually incorrect. There is no doubt to the virgin birth. Okay, so there's no doubt about that. What happened afterwards? Let's examine the word until. Until does not imply that afterwards some event or, or something took place. It is just a manner of speaking. We can read many examples of this in scriptures. For example, St. Jerome and St. Chrysostom focus on this passage and also point out some other examples where we see this word used and needs to be important and not taken out of context. In 2 Kings, in, and uh, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Now, you and I know that it's impossible to have a child after you're dead. So what it's saying is that even until that moment, she did not have a child. Further on, we see in the psalmist, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool. It is not as if he would not sit at the right hand afterwards. There are some examples of how the words till, until, before, before that, do not actually mean an event took place afterwards. 
In the same line in other Bibles passages, the word she had born a son is stated as her firstborn. Now, St. Jerome, who in the, the 5th century was the first to actually translate the, the scriptures from the um, Hebrew Greek text, so he had access to them, into the what we call the Latin Vulgate at the time. And St. Jerome explains that Christ is called the firstborn of Mary, not because she, there was another son or, or after him, but because before him there had been none. And he was the first one to open the actual womb. And it's also a custom of scripture to call the only born the firstborn. For example, in Exodus, God calls the people of Israel his firstborn. Does that mean God had other people as well? No. And he is said to have slain all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. And he commanded that, the, that all the firstborn to be sanctified to him. Among whom, for sure, there was only one born as well. This doesn't imply that there were any others who were born afterwards. And it's very important to understand the manners of speaking. So these two passages, or these two particular words, in this first passage about the firstborn and did not have relationships with her or did not know her until she had her first child, we can conclude that for sure that Mary only had one son and nothing after that. And she remained a virgin before, during and after, till now and forever. Hence the dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now let's look at another passage where Ashley says that brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, quote, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood outside asking to speak to him. He replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brethren. For whoever does the will of my father is in heaven, is my brother and sister and mother. So our Lord basically says that anyone who does his will is his mother, brother and sister and not necessarily referring to a direct relation in terms of being a sibling. But we can also take this a bit further and understand that these brothers and sisters that we are referred to here are actually the cousins of Jesus. Further down and also in Matthew's Gospel, we hear, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Let us look at this objection and let's refute it. Some think that the brothers of Christ have been the sons of Joseph and Mary, born after the birth of Jesus Christ, or even children of St. Joseph, like stepbrothers and sisters to Jesus on a previous marriage. However, St. Jerome, St. Hilary and St. Ambrose all make this same argument that this is a false claim. They state that the cousins and kindred of Christ were called his brothers, such as James the Less, Joses, Jude. It would appear, therefore, that James and Joses were the sons of the sisters of Mary the Virgin, who was also herself called Mary. Because in St. John, the evangelist, chapter 19, verse 25, he calls Mary the daughter of Cleophas and the wife of Alphaeus, the sister of the mother of the Lord. But St. Matthew and St. Mark call the same Mary the mother of James the Less and Joses. It may also be the case that this Mary was actually the sister-in-law of the Virgin Mary. In other words, Joseph's brother's wife, so to speak. It is important to understand that cousins and kindred were often called brothers and sisters, as can be proved by many examples. Let's look at Lot, for example. Lot 
in Genesis, whom scripture states to have been the son of Aram, who is the brother of Abraham, who was called the brother of Abraham. And Laban, though he was the brother of the mother of Jacob, is called the brother of Jacob. In this way, those named above are called the brothers of the Lord. When Jesus' mother and brethren had arrived, Jesus states, Who is my brethren? Who is my mother? Jesus once again wishes to teach us all that anyone who follows him is his brother, sister and mother. It is therefore important and crucial to examine scripture in its context. And I've repeated this a couple of times now. It's very, very important. Once we take something out of context and don't understand the ways and mannerisms, the idioms and how they express things, we will lose context of scriptures. Very important. And this is why we as Catholics need the teaching authority. And as I mentioned earlier, we have got scripture and we have tradition. And we need the church to help us understand through the fathers, through the apostles. Our Lord gave this authority to the apostles. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of God. To St. Peter. Peter, to Peter, he says before he ascends, Peter, do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep, etc. What does all that mean? He gave them the authority. He sent them out to teach. And so the church teaches us through the understanding of scripture, through the understanding of many other variables around scripture, to explain to us what these passages mean. We can really get into a knot if we don't use that. Now let's have a look at idioms and the ways of speaking. If we were to say, if I was to say to you, take your head out of the sand. Does it imply that you as a person have your head in the sand? No, it doesn't. It means, what does it mean? It means wake up and know what is going on. Don't bury your head and ignore things that are around you. So in examining these passages in the context, it becomes clear to us that these brothers and sisters are not other biological children of the Blessed Mother. So when we look at the translations, the translators remained true to the Hebrew Aramaic idioms. Okay? Remaining true to the Hebrew Aramaic idioms, how they spoke of the times. So when the scriptures around about the 3rd or, or, or 2nd century BC translated the, the Old Testament or the scriptures into Greek, we call this the Septuagint, which being 70 translators, they had to make two decisions. They either had to stick to the original idiom. So, for example, if they said brothers and sisters, well, the translation in Greek would have to be brothers and sisters. Now, in Greek, you do have cousins and you do have sister-in-law, but they decided which one shall we go? So they decided to remain true to the idioms. So the Greek word adelphos is used in these passages, and it literally actually means brother. Also adelphi, which is means sister. So in translating the words of Jesus from Aramaic Hebrew to the Greek, in which the books of the New Testament were also written, the translation would need to remain true to the original meaning of the language spoken or written in, in originally at the time. Hebrew and Aramaic do not have a word for cousin, nephew, kins, kinsman, or various others. To say cousin in Hebrew or Aramaic, one must either say son of my father's brother or brother in Hebrew. And Hebrew is what's, sorry, the brother is what's chosen in Hebrew. And so the New Testament authors had the same choices to make. And the authors could follow the example of the Septuagint and the Aramaic idiom, calling cousins and, and other kinsmen and women brothers and sisters. Or they could actually call them as is in the Greek text. Or they could use a dynamic translation, such as the Greek word anepsios, or, which means cousin. Anepsios means cousin. Instead, they chose to follow the Aramaic idiom, which was the most natural choice given their sources and thus used the word adelphos or the plural adelphi for the cousins and kinsmen. 
So how do we know this new translation of the New Testament writers followed the Aramaic idiom? Well, first of all, the Greek word for cousin, anepsios, is never used. Second, we know that certain people were not brothers or sisters as we have shown earlier. And finally, St. Matthew, St. Mark, and also St. John provide the reader with the clearest evidence that Mary had only one son in Jesus and no others. St. John notes that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was present at Jesus' crucifixion. St. Matthew and also St. Mark describe this same woman as the mother of James and Joseph. So, how can this be? Because they are cousins. Also, it is also customary, another thing also to prove that Mary only had Jesus and Jesus had no other siblings. It's also customary in the Jewish tradition that in the absence of the father, the husband who had passed, who deceased, the children will look after the mother. So who do we find at the crucifixion when Jesus says, woman, Jesus says his mother, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to them, to his mother, woman, behold your son. Disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, this is interesting because if Mary had other children, where are they? And if she did, our Lord just insulted his siblings by giving her to somebody else to look after. So Mary never had any other children. She only had Jesus. And to conclude this particular episode and to sum up, Mary is was, and ever will be, perpetual virgin. This is a dogma, a dogma of a perpetual virginity, binding on me and you to believe, and I have taken you through a journey, and I am glad you remain till the end. If you have enjoyed this particular episode of Learned Something, we welcome you to subscribe to our channel just to look at more other content on Mary and other topics of the Catholic Church. And we also invite you to like and share with those whom you feel may benefit from this video. God be with you. See you next time.